right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's great to see so many people here so late in the day. Uh, we got the big room as well, so that's exciting. My name is Miro Tsubak. I uh, work for a Canadian company called DNA Stack, where we've built a cloud platform for genomics. But I'm here today to actually talk about Java 9. Uh, we do a lot of Java development in DNA Stack, and we're not running Java 9 in production yet. But uh, it's something I've been playing around with for uh, quite, quite a while, and I'm actually really passionate about clean, writing clean code as well. So I thought I would combine the two and basically talk about what's new in Java 9 and how that affects our ability uh, to write clean code. So we're going to talk about uh, basically small things people don't usually talk about. So various convenience methods, uh, small APIs, minor enhancements to existing APIs in Java 9. And let's just see how it goes. So before we get to it, I think I should clarify two things. Why are we talking about Java 9? And what does it actually mean to write clean code? Uh, we're talking about Java 9 because it's essentially the latest uh, big release. Of course, Java 10 was released in March, but it's much smaller release than Java 9. Java 9 came out about three and a half years after Java 8. So we can imagine that plenty of things had the time to make it into the release during those three and a half years. In comparison, Java 10, you know, six months after Java 9, relatively small release, introduces relatively low level features. So yeah, basically talking about Java 9 because that's the big recent deal. In terms of clean code, I think everybody kind of has intuitive understanding on what it actually means to write clean code. And I'm sure many of you have seen these two comic strips. I also like a definition from William Zinser, who is actually a writer, not a coder. But he wrote a lot around writing in English, particularly writing in English as a second language. And he identified these four principles of good writing in English, which are clarity, simplicity, brevity, and humanity. And I think this really applies to writing clean code as well. You want your code to be clear, you want it to be simple, you want it ideally to be short, and you want it to be human readable. So it's really about the focus on the reader, about simplicity and having code that's easy to understand. Uh, I would like to recomm recommend these two books, which actually sort of provided the basis for this talk, uh, Clean Code and Effective Java, probably the best books uh, I've read on software engineering. If you haven't read those, I definitely recommend doing that. So what are we actually talking about today? I would like to cover these eight things. We're going to talk about uh, convenience factory methods for collections, improved drive with resources statement, private methods in interfaces, uh, diamond operator, and its use in anonymous classes, various stream API enhancements, extensions to optional, stack walker, and HTTP2 client. It's quite an aggressive schedule, so let's see how far we can get uh, in the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, so before, before we go to the first API, uh, I would like to say a few things about JShell. JShell is a new tool in Java 9, and we're actually going to use it to demonstrate examples for all these other APIs. So let me just switch to my terminal here. What you can see here is JShell. JShell is uh, Java's implementation of REPL, read of all print loop. So it's a tool that continuously loops, reads your input, evaluates it, and prints out the output. So it's very similar to command line tools as you know them from other languages, like Groovy, Scala, Python. They have all had that for a while. And with Java 9, Java got an official REPL as well. Uh, JShell was primarily designed for learners of the language, but it's actually a pretty powerful tool for experienced developers as well. It's basically really good whenever you want to try something uh, really quickly. So it's good for prototyping, good for exploring new APIs, good if you're switching technology stacks, you work on a project in Python, you're coming back to Java, you just need a refresher of how certain things work. Uh, JShell is a great tool for that as well. I've used it during interviews as well. Just a nice sort of well-rounded tool. So what you can see here is that I'm actually running uh, JShell version 10, which means that I'm actually running Java 10. And there's no real reason for me to do it. Everything we're talking about are Java 9 features. Uh, but they did actually fix a couple of bugs in JShell with Java 10, so I thought I might as well use it. It just makes it easier for me. So the main thing that you need to know about JShell is that it accepts two types of inputs. There's snippets, so the actual Java code that you want to evaluate, and there's commands to the actual JShell tool, which always start with a slash. And you will see a few, a few of these throughout the talk. But let's start with something really simple here. I'm just going to type 1 plus 1. And you can see two interesting things here. By the way, is this big enough for people in the back? Can you read this? <coughs> Great. So the two interesting things here, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 2 was assigned to something called $1 here. And $1 is an implicit variable that JShell created for me. And it does that whenever you have an expression that you don't assign to anything. I could have, of course, created my own variable. Let's call this x. And I would have an explicit named variable x. 
Uh, JShell provides a bunch of keyboard shortcuts. You've seen me use the first one here. Shift tab and V introduces a new variable, and it infers the type of the variable from the expression. There's also sort of standard tab completion, as you would expect from any other shell. If I just print this variable, uh, I can rely on the tab completion here. And I'll just print x, and it works nicely. There's also a couple of sort of syntactic shortcuts, if you will. For example, you've noticed that to evaluate 1 plus 1, I didn't need to wrap it in anything. I just typed 1 plus 1 as it was. Similarly, I didn't need to use a semicolon at the end of my statement. I also wouldn't need to worry about catching exceptions, even checked exceptions. For example, if I wanted to put JShell to sleep, I can just do thread sleep, which actually throws an interrupted exception, which is a checked exception. But I will just say 2000, and it's going to work without any problems. So this brings us to the first command. And the first command is actually command vars, which lists all the variables that I've declared. Similarly, there's command methods and types. Of course, I don't have any at this point, but we'll create a few throughout this talk. And finally, there's a command called list, which lists all the active snippets. By the way, JShell has this prefix matching going on. So as long as you specify a unique prefix of a command, it's going to find it correctly and execute it correctly. So I could have just done something like this. And finally, the last command that you should know of is the command help, which actually is a pretty thorough documentation for JShell, and it tells you pretty much everything that you can do with the tool. So these are sort of JShell basics. Uh, let's move to the first API, and that's convenience factory methods for collections. So Java 9 makes it really easy to create small immutable collections, which was something that was relatively tedious to do in the previous releases of the platform. And I'm sure everybody knows the drill. If I wanted to create, let's say, a set, I would just do a hash set here, say hash set of string. Let's call this a set and actually make it an interface. Then I can add a couple of elements, say a, b, c. And finally, to make it immutable, I would wrap it in collections, a modifiable set, set. So, this is fine, but there are a couple of problems with this approach. Um, for example, it, it took me, what, like five lines of code to create a very simple set that's obviously uh, not ideal. On top of that, it's not even a truly immutable collection. It's more like an immutable view of the underlying collection. Uh, so if I kept the reference to the original collection, which I have, in fact, here, I would still be able to modify it. But thankfully, uh, Java 9 gives us a way to create truly immutable collections, and it's really convenient and just overall nice. So that's accomplished through static factory methods on all the main interfaces, list, set, and map. So if I wanted to create a list, I can just use the method of here. And you can see that it's overloaded here quite a few times, actually, 12 to be exact. So it's uh, always 0 to 10 elements and then a single varag method. So you might be thinking at this point, you know, wh why did we have such a polluted API that's not very clean? Why don't we just have a single varag method, which obviously would catch all the other cases as well, right? And uh, that's a completely valid argument. The reason is essentially performance. There's performance overhead associated with allocating the array to back the var arc. So if you're creating reasonably small collections, which presumably is the vast majority of use cases, you want to avoid this penalty. So if I wanted to create a simple list, I can just do something like this, and let's call it a list. And now if I try to add something to this list, it's actually going to complain. This is an unknown operation, because really it is immutable. In fact, if I take a look at the class, it's actually going to say that this is not an array list. It's some special immutable implementation of a list. And an interesting thing to note here, this immutable collections are not actually a part of the public API. So you can only rely on the interfaces here. And the only way to obtain them is using the static factory methods on interfaces, which means that they're not inherited. So you cannot evoke them through an implementing class, which means that this is pretty much the only way to obtain such a list. And I just wanted to put this out as a nice design pattern, which allows the implementation to change in the future. So that's pretty cool. The API for a set is uh, actually exactly the same. Again, 12 methods, 0 to 10 arguments, uh, and a single var arc. For a map, it's a bit different. If we take a look here, and you can't actually see too well because of the wrapping, but there's only 11 methods here. So it's 0 to 10 arguments. There's no var arc method. And the reason for that is uh, keys and values can have different types, and you cannot have two var arcs in a single method. So what they did instead, they provided a method called of entries which takes a single var arc of type map entry, and you can use a convenience method here to just create entries. So I can do something like this, which gives me a map where keys and integer 
and value is a string. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It's just a nice little convenience feature. So to recap, uh, we can now obtain truly immutable collections using off and off entries methods. It's probably a good idea to static import the entry method because you're not losing anything. It's just nice and readable. This approach is not verbose. It's actually a one-liner, which means that if you're using it for static collections, you don't need static initializer blocks, which is very nice and clean as well. There's no need to use arrays as list and stream off, which were a common construct to make creation of collections one-liner before, right? Now we have a much better way, so don't use them anymore. Similarly, no need to use external libraries just for the purpose of having uh, immutable collections. Guava was a common example in this category. And because they're all immutable, there's no need to worry about leaving references behind. They're automatically thread safe, can be shared freely, no need to create defensive copies. And they actually have a pretty good performance because they don't need to worry about mutability, so they're saving cycles on, on the checks related to that. A good rule of thumb as well is to default to creating immutable collections. So until now, developers typically defaulted to creating immutable collections because it was just easier. But now you really don't have any excuse, so just make it immutable by default, and then only if you need mutability, make it mutable. So this brings us to the, the next part, and that's improved tribe with resources. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the basic construct because it has been around for a while since uh, Java 1.7, I think. And tribe with resources essentially allows us to specify a resource in the tribe block, and that resource is going to be closed for us automatically when we're done with it instead of the original, you know, try finally, where we have to close all the input streams and output streams in the finally block. Uh, so that has been available since Java 1.7, and I have an example here. I'm just going to open an external file. Uh, and if we take a look at this method here, it's just an example of uh, try with resources. What this method actually does, it essentially copies a file from disk to standard output. So what we're doing here is we're creating a buffered reader. We're pointing it to a file that's passed as an argument. We are creating a second reader as a local variable. We need to create a fresh variable just so that Java can manage closing of this resource. So we just assign this, uh, this reader here. And then we read it one line by line and print it out. So very simple method. And you know there's a couple of things that are not clean about this code. But uh, the one that we're worried about uh, in this context is actually this extra fresh variable that I created for the sole purpose of being able to close this automatically, right? That shouldn't be necessary. And that's exactly the kind of functionality that was added in Java 9. So in Java 9, as long as you have final variables or variables that are effectively final, you can just use them here, and they're going to be managed. So effectively final means that you don't declare the variable as final, but you know you just never modify it after initializing it. So we could actually modify this, uh, modify this method, and I'm just going to remove this second reader here. And so let's change the invocation to actually use the original reader. And you can see that it compiled fine. And if I try to use it, I actually have a file ready here, which only contains a single line. It just says, hello, Geekon. But let's see if this works. And it works fine. So in this case, we could actually clean it up a bit more because we're using, we're, we're performing a very specific functionality, right? We're essentially copying a file between two streams. And that's also another method that was added in Java 9, which is kind of unrelated to this, but still very relevant. So Java 9 added a transfer to method on the input stream, which allows you to connect this input stream, essentially pipe it to an output stream, and it's going to read everything from the input and put it on the output. So I could rewrite this whole code uh, just using a file input stream, pointing it to my file. Uh, econ txt, and then I can just use the transfer to method system out, and it will actually do the same thing. So two little convenience methods here, uh, and that's pretty much it. So to to conclude, uh, tribe of resources is great. Definitely, you should use it all the time. There's no need to use the legacy try finally, and it's especially a bad idea to use finalizer for this. Uh, be aware of the convenience methods that might make this easier for you, such as input stream transfer to. For some specific cases, you might find a better method somewhere else in the API. And don't create unnecessary helper objects. Uh, in this case, you know, in the try 
try block. So the next thing for us are private methods in interfaces. And I'm sure that everybody is aware that since Java 8, the statement that interfaces don't contain implementation is no longer true, right? Because Java 8 introduced default methods, which actually allow us to specify code in the interfaces. And that was a good idea. Essentially, default methods allow us to evolve the API by providing a default implementation for some method. Everybody that implements that interface automatically gets the default implementation unless they decide to override it, which, of course, they can. So let's go back to JShell here. And I have, a, I have an example for uh, an interface here. I'm just going to open this file. And let's take a look at this interface. And it's a very simple interface. It has a single, completely abstract method that I need to implement. And it has a default method, which doesn't do much. It just prints out that the method has been called. I also have a class here. Uh, called my class. Let's take a look at this one as well. And this class implements the interface, provides the implementation for the abstract, abstract method, just prints out that it was called, uh, has no knowledge of the default method, right? But of course, both methods work here. So if I instantiate the class, uh, I can call the abstract method, but I can also call the default method here. So now the situation is that you have a default method and your API grows, right? You're adding more default methods. Uh, suddenly you realize that there's something that they should be sharing. Uh, maybe you, know, you just have a single default method, but it just grows too long. And you would like to split some functionality somewhere else to keep it readable. But prior to Java 9, you just had no way of doing that. Because you, th th that would imply that you're introducing another method to your API, uh, which means that you need to support it forever, right? But thankfully, in Java 9, we actually have private methods and interfaces for this purpose of kind of you know, taking functionality from default methods and having it somewhere else. So I can demonstrate this really quickly. I'm just going to edit my interface here. And let's add a private method here at the end. Let's just do private void private method. And let's just print out the same thing. Let's close everything, and let's also call all this private method from this default method. So hopefully this works. Yeah, correctly compiled. Now I can try uh, again calling it from my class. You can see that it calls the private method. If I try to call the private method directly, uh, it won't work because, of course, it's not a part of the API. So just a nice little addition in Java 9 that allows us to uh, clean up our code a little bit. So to recap, default methods, like all the other methods, should be short. So you have a long default method, extract the functionality to separate private methods. Don't repeat yourself. If you have a multiple methods sharing the same functionality, again, extract it using the private methods. And it should also be pointed out uh, that you should be using default methods very carefully. If you're creating a new API, you're introducing a new interface, it's completely fair to add a default method that provides some sort of a default behavior. If you're changing an existing API, you should be really careful. Because even though you're not breaking backwards compatibility, you might break something. Because you simply have no way of knowing how people are implementing your interfaces or extending your classes, and you cannot possibly maintain all the invariants that they might be imposing, right? So just something to think about before you start introducing default methods uh, to your API. So the next thing for us is uh, the diamond operator with anonymous classes. And that is actually pretty simple. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows what the diamond operator is. I will just open an example here. And this example loads these two snippets at the end. So the first snippets, snippet just creates an error list, so it demonstrates the use of the diamond operator. You can see that I'm specifying the string on the left side. On the right side, I'm just using the diamond. The second example does essentially the same thing, but it does that with an anonymous class. And we, could, we weren't able to use the diamond operator with anonymous classes prior to Java 9. We had to specify this string on both sides. And that's really just an inconsistency and an annoyance. But that, again, has been fixed in Java 9. So in Java 9, I can actually modify this supplier here, and I can just completely remove this string on the right side, and it will work just fine. I can actually try calling the method, and works nicely. Uh, 
So just to recap, basically, now it's consistent, right? So feel free to use the diamond operator everywhere as you would normally. Uh, it leads to slightly improved readability and consistency. And it, it should be noted that anonymous classes, you don't see them that often now that we have lambdas, right? Lambdas are much more popular, but that doesn't mean that there's no use case for anonymous classes anymore. So an example would be you want to instantiate an abstract class or an interface that's not functional, an interface that has multiple abstract methods. Anonymous class is still really useful for this purpose. So that's the diamond operator. What do we have next? Stream API enhancements. Yeah, so one interesting thing to realize with streams is that they're not suitable for everything. You can essentially make them work for almost everything, but that doesn't mean that you should do it. There are still many scenarios where using streams is not optimal, and by using four, you actually end up with uh, much cleaner code. And it's important to know the boundary. And Java 9 essentially makes streams suitable for more use cases by introducing a couple of interesting methods. I just want to mention two methods here. And the first one is actually method iterate. So let's take a look here. I'm just going to investigate, uh, let's say, in stream. And if we take a look at the method iterate here, you can see that there are two versions. The first one was available in Java 8. The second one was added in Java 9. And the difference between them is this predicate here. So how does this work? Well, let's take an example. Let's say I want to print all the even numbers that are less than 100, right? Even numbers less than 100. Now, there are multiple ways of doing this, but a very naive and natural approach in Java 8 could be something like this. Let's iterate from 0, uh, increment by 2 in every step, and then I'm going to filter. Uh, filter the numbers that are less than 100. And then I'm going to print everything, just to use a quick uh, method reference here. And you can see that it kind of works, but not really. And it's very easy to introduce a bug like that if you don't pay enough attention, even in such a simple example. So what happened here, I actually created an infinite stream, and I did correctly filter the first 100 numbers, but the stream kept going and my integer went over, suddenly all my integers were less than 100, right? And there actually wasn't a really good way of dealing with this in Java 8. Or actually, for this specific case, we could probably come up with something, because we know how many numbers there are, right? I know there are 50 numbers that are even, that are less than 100. So I could just replace this filter here with limit and just say, give me the first 50 numbers, right? And this would work just fine. But of course, you don't have that luxury all the time. You don't always know how many elements you're going to get in advance. So actually, Java 9 added functionality that helps us deal with it. In Java 9, we have a method called takeWhile. Uh, so I can just replace this filter here with takeWhile. And takeWhile is essentially a version of limit that takes a predicate uh, instead of a number. And there's a complementary method, dropWhile, which is like a version of skip that takes a predicate instead of a number. So with takeWhile, this would actually work nicely. But we can still do better. We can clean this up a bit more. And in, in Java 9, we can actually completely remove this take while statement. And we can just take the condition and put it directly in the iterate and just have something like this. And this will work nicely. And if you take a look at this, it actually reads like a four cycle. And that's basically what it is. It's like a streamified version of four uh, that was added in this release of Java. So the second method that I wanted to mention is the method of nullable. As I'm sure you're aware, you can create streams of arbitrary elements. I can create streams containing, let's say, one. What I couldn't do is put a null here, because you don't want to have nulls in streams. What I can do in Java 9, however, is to use the method of nullable and actually give it a null. And this is going to go through just fine. But if I take a look at this stream, you can see that it's not a stream containing a null. It's actually an empty stream. So of nullable is kind of a shortcut method for dealing with this. And it's especially useful if you're dealing with really long streams. If you have streams where you have many MAMs kind of chained onto each other, uh, at some point, more likely, you're going to end up with nulls in your streams. And you will need to filter them out, which means that at some point in your stream, you'll need to have an if statement or a ternary operator or some sort of a check like this. And that's not really clean code, right? So this method allows you to kind of remove that check. And that's pretty useful. So that's the stream API. Uh, to recap, uh, be aware of the new stream methods. Take while, drop while, and iterate. They can make streams useful for you for some new scenarios. Also check for convenience uh, stream-related methods in other APIs. Uh, 
Uh, that's actually something that I really like about Java 9. Java 9 sort of ties up the loose ends from Java 8, and it brings streams to APIs where streams previously weren't. So now you can you know, stream results of pattern matching directly, or you can stream dates, so let's say if you're trying to find you know, dates between two dates. Uh, so yeah, check out our APIs as well. There might be a convenience method for you already. Avoid unnecessary null checks. Use of nullable instead in your streams. And it should also be noted that although streams are suitable for more cases now, just don't think of them as a universal solution. There are still plenty of cases where you shouldn't use streams. Typical examples would be you need access or you need to modify uh, a local variable, or maybe you have streams where you need to access the same thing in multiple stages of the pipeline. If you find yourself kind of passing multiple things through multiple stages, that's kind of a sign that you probably maybe shouldn't use a stream for this. Maybe you're better off with a four. So that's the stream API. Uh, this brings us to the next chunk, and that's extensions to optional. I'm sure everybody knows uh, optional. Optional was introduced in Java 8. It's essentially a container that may or may not contain a non-null value. So it was introduced basically to let us uh, minimize the number of places where a null pointer exception can be found. And for all intents and purposes, it behaves as a collection with a single element. The basic API is actually really simple. I can create an empty optional, or I can create an optional containing something. What I also had available in Java 8 was a method called if present. And if present looks inside the optional, if there is a value, it performs an action on that value. If there's no value, it doesn't do anything. Uh, so I can do something like if present, let's just print this value. And it would just print out something. So Java 9 added three methods that all have something to do with default values, and they allow us to get rid of some boilerplate around handling default values for optionals. The first method on the list is if present or else. And the name is pretty self-explanatory. I'm sure you can guess how it behaves. It behaves exactly as if present, if there is a value. If there's no value, it allows us to specify a default action. So I can just change this to use or else, and this actually takes a runnable as the second argument. So if it's empty, I will just print this is empty. And of course, in this case, there is something in this optional. If I had an empty optional instead, I would actually get to that branch. Just like this. The second method that was added is the method OR. And to understand what the method OR is about, let's first take a look at two other methods that were available in Java 8 that do something very similar. So in Java 8, we had methods OR ELSE and OR ELSE GET. So OR ELSE uh, basically takes a look in the optional. If there is a value, it returns at that value. Otherwise, you can specify a default value to return. So for an empty optional, we can do something like this. Let's just return empty, and this will work nicely. OR ELSE GET does essentially the same thing, but it's a bit more flexible. It takes a supplier. So we can do something like this. But if you take a look at these methods, what they have in common is that they're dealing with values inside the optionals. They're not dealing with the optionals directly. And that's what the method OR is about. So the method OR takes a look inside the optional. If there is a value, it returns the same optional. Otherwise, we can specify a default optional to return. So I will just modify this to use OR and I can just use the supplier to return an optional that actually contains the string empty, for example. So this is really useful for creating sort of fluent chains of behaviors of optionals. And the last method that I wanted to mention here is the method stream, and the method stream basically converts an optional to a stream. So if there is a value, it creates a stream containing a single element. That's the value. If the optional is empty, it will be an empty stream. So let's take a look here. And let's try to print all the elements. Of course, in this case, it's an empty stream. If I actually had something in this optional, it would work nicely. This method might not look like much, but it's actually particularly useful when you're dealing with streams containing optionals. And I can create a very simple example here. I'll just use the convenience factory methods here to create a collection of optionals. Let's say optional of some number, then an empty optional, and an optional of something else. 
and I will just convert it to stream. And now, let's say I want to filter out the empty optionals, right? Uh, the traditional Java 8 approach would be to apply a filter, and I'm going to filter on whatever is present here, right? And then I'm going to apply a map and extract the value. So I'm mapping to the get method here. And finally, I will just print everything. And this works nicely. In Java 9, then now there is a much better way of doing this. You can completely remove this map here uh, and the filter as well. And I can just apply a flat map and map to optional stream. And this does the same thing. Just uh, think about it, but it's actually, you know, once you kind of use it a couple of times, it becomes very intuitive and, you know, it saves you a few things. So that's optionals. To recap, uh, you should use if present or else method instead of an if statement where you would have is present, right? Like that's kind of uh, a natural extension. Let's say I'm using if present, Java 8, if present, and I need to suddenly specify, you know, the other branch. Naturally, I would just convert it to an if. That's probably not the best solution. Use the method or to have a clean, fluent way of changing behaviors on optionals. And use the method stream to take advantage of the lazy nature of streams. Uh, methods on optionals are usually eager. And also to handle streams of optionals. And remember that is present is rarely the best solution. Usually one of the methods that we've gone through uh, allows you to solve the problem better. So this brings us to the final part of this uh, talk. And I just want to talk about two APIs. Uh, Stackwalker is an API for easy, lazy, and stream-friendly access uh, to stack traces. And it's a good example of an API that has been done in a very clean way. And it's very specific. It does one particular thing, and it does it really well, and replaces an old API, which was actually not doing this thing very well. And I'm sure you all know uh, the old API. That's something that has been around since Java 1.4. And if I wanted to obtain a stack trace, I would create a throwable and then call the getStackTrace method on this. And this actually returns an array of stack trace elements. So if I print this, this is my stack trace at this point in time. And there are a couple of problems with this approach. First of all, uh, the JVM needs to capture a snapshot of the entire stack eagerly, even if you only need access to the top few elements, which is very expensive. It's also just an array, so you don't have any convenience methods for you know, filtering or, uh, or whatnot. You can't easily access the actual class instances of the classes declaring the methods. And on, on top of that, you don't actually have a guarantee that you're seeing the entire stack trace. The specification actually says that the JVM is allowed to emit certain elements for performance. But thankfully, all, all these things are addressed in the form of the new Stackwalker API. So the new Stackwalker API is built around a class called Stackwalker, where we can obtain an instance, and basically call the walk method there, which is kind of like the main method. And this allows us to manipulate stack traces as streams. So I can collect the stack trace uh, into a list. And this is my stack trace right now, very similar to the output that I got from get stack trace. But now I can take advantage of all the stream methods. I can if I want access to the top of the stack trace, I can just insert the limit here, let's say top three elements, and I will get the top three elements of the stack. Similarly, if I want to have access to the actual class instances, I can just tell the stack walker to uh, retain the references, and then I'm just going to remove this limit here and replace it with a map that extracts the class information. So for each frame, give me the declaring class. And these are all the classes involved in my stack. And now, if I was only interested in a particular class, say this util class here, I can easily, again, take advantage of the stream methods and just apply a filter here and just filter uh, classes that are equal to my chosen class here. And we can see that we have two matches here. So just a nice, uh, you know, little, very clean API for accessing stack traces, much better than uh, dealing with the old stuff. So to sum up, uh, prefer collections and streams to arrays. That's the difference between these two APIs, uh, among other stuff. Access stack traces lazily through the walk method. Uh, take advantage of the stream API to access only certain elements, things like filtering, limiting, that sort of thing. Uh, 
And just be aware that there are some configuration options for Stackwalker. You, so you will rarely be in a situation where you need to do something manually. Like let's say if you wanted to obtain references to the classes, you don't need to do it manually you know, from their string representations. There's a configuration option for it, and there's a couple of other ones. So just be aware of it and you know, look into it if you're looking for something specific related to stack traces. And now, uh, the final part of this talk, and uh, that's the new HTTP2 client. So the new HTTP2 client in Java is actually a much cleaner alternative to the old HTTP URL connection. Uh, but on, not only that, it also supports all the cool new things. So it supports HTTP2 with TLS, it supports WebSockets, uh, server push, basic auth uh, authentication, uh, asynchronous requests, proxies, cookies, all the good stuff. Uh, the client is actually delivered as an incubator module in Java 9 and 10, which means that it's not completely finished. It lives in a special namespace and it's not resolved by default, but I pre-imported it into JShell so that we can work with it. Um, the basic API is actually really simple, but to demonstrate the client API, I'm going to need the server. And if there's anything that I've learned from speaking at conferences that you cannot rely on the inter in internet there. So I'm just going to create a simple Java server here uh, on my own, just using the functionality provided as part of the JDK. I think it's a pretty nice example. I don't think many people are aware that you have this in the JDK. So let's start uh, by creating the handler. I will create an HTTP handler here. Let's call it handler. And this is going to execute the Lambda that takes an HTTP exchange. And it's going to, to actually multi-line Lambda, which, by the way, is not a sign of clean code, but I'm just using this because I'm pressed for time. In a, your actual code, you shouldn't do multi-line Lambdas. It's better to just extract it to a separate method. So in this case, I'm going to create the simplest possible server. I'll just create a server that has a single endpoint. And no matter what I said, send to this endpoint, it's going to respond with a fixed string. So let me just define this string here. Let's call it body. Let's say hello geekon. And now I will uh, set the response headers. So I'm always going to respond with 200. Everything is OK. And just attach the length uh, of this string. And finally, I will open an output stream, assign the response body, And then I will use the output stream to write uh, the string to the actual response. And this is a, just an output stream, so I'll need to call get bytes, but that's fine. And then just close everything. So we take a look here. This is my handler here. Looks OK. Hopefully it works. So now let's try to create the uh, actual server. So I will create an HTTP server the create method, which requires a port, let's say uh, 8,000. Don't need the backlog. And let's call this HS. Then I will create my endpoint, say slash hello, and attach my favorite handler to it. And then finally, I will start the server. So now the server is hopefully running. To test this, I'm going to need a client. So let's first take a look at the old HTTP URL connection API, see how that works, and then compare it to the new API. So uh, the old HTTP URL connection, in order to do use it, I would first start by creating a URI, which is pointing to my local server. So I'm going to do HTTP localhost. I actually, I think I used 8000 slash hello. Let's call this URI. Then I will convert this URI to a URL so that I can open a connection on it. And you can see that this actually returns a URL connection, which is not what I want. I want an HTTP URL connection. So I will need to cast this to an HTTP URL connection. And you can see that I'm just starting out here. This API is already getting really ugly. I need to cast. I need to you know, convert to URL, which is uses a weird case. I always get confused about that. Uh, let's call this C. Then I will need to set the request method, which is actually set as a string. Again, not very nice. Uh, and finally, I can see if this works uh, by calling the get response code uh, method. So fingers crossed, 200. This is looking promising. So let's try and read the actual response. So I will open an input stream. Uh, get input stream. Get input stream. 
uh, I will wrap it in an input stream reader and wrap this in a buffered reader, standard Java boilerplate. And then finally, I can call the readLine method, and we can see that it actually says hello geekon. So it works, but it was quite painful to get there, especially on the client side. So let's try this now with the new API. And the new API is actually built around three main classes. There's HTTP client, HTTP request, and HTTP response, nicely separated. So I'll start with the client here, and just create a new HTTP client, so let's call it client. Then I will create an HTTP respond, a request, which uh, actually uses a builder pattern. So I can just obtain the builder here, give it my URI from before, call the get method nicely as a method here, and call build, and let's call this a request. And finally, I can use the client to send the request to my server and this also takes something called body handler here. And in this case, I'm just going to tell it to treat everything as string. Thankfully, there's a built-in handler for this. So just like this, and let's call this response. And now to extract the status code, couldn't be simpler, just call the status code method. To extract the body, simple again, just call the body method. Everything works. And this API is actually really flexible as well. So if I wanted to make this asynchronous, for example, all I need to do is actually change this send to send async, which now is going to return a completable future. Let's call this response again. And then I can extract the value from the completable future, call the body method, and it works almost exactly the same. So just a very cool little API. There's actually quite a lot of functionality here. They have all sorts of things for like handling TLL, TLS, managing certificates, that sort of thing. Just uh, feel free to check it out. So to wrap up, uh, there is a very clean separation and very clean design in the new client. There's HTTP client, HTTP request, HTTP response classes. The old HTTP URL connection is actually not very pleasant to use. Uh, one of the disadvantages of the old API is that it has a lot of side effects. So th that's also a good point, you know, don't write API that have side effects. The new client API is very versatile, flexible, really clean. And it is part of the JDK. You should prefer functionality that's available as part of the JDK uh, because it's just good. It you know makes your code base smaller. It makes your code base easy to learn. Uh, you get good performance. It's very well tested. You know very few things are so well tested uh, as the JDK, and it's part of the JDK. So you get interoperability for free. But be aware that it's an incubator module for now. So maybe you know consider if you want to use this in your production code. Uh, Hopefully, it will be finalized soon in one of the next releases of the JDK. So that's pretty much it. Before we go, what I can do is actually uh, save the session of this JShell to a file, and I can post it uh, somewhere on Twitter, and I can also share the slides there. Uh, here's my Twitter handle here. If you're interested in some more Java 9 things, I have a couple of blog posts on my blog. Feel free to check it out. And otherwise, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be around here for the next couple of minutes.